Baltimore is a young, eager, anonymous team with a young, eager, anonymous coach. But the Colts and Howard Schnellenberger hope to surprise some people in 74. Last week, the Colts did just that with a healthy first quarter drive against the heavily favored Pittsburgh Steelers. Glenn Doughty's catch moved the ball close, but with fourth down and one foot to go for a TD, the Callow Colts met their match at the Steel Curtain. The Steeler defense turned Baltimore back, then turned the ball over to the man of the hour. Jefferson Street Joe Gilliam had won the Pittsburgh quarterback lottery with an incredible preseason aerial show. Now he would try to defend his position by the same method. Under Gilliam, the freewheeling Steeler offense looks like a throwback to the early pass-happy 60s, with super cool number 17 filling the air with hard, tight spiral. Gilliam has an added advantage this year. A new fleet of sure-handed receivers like rookie John Stallworth, number 82. Another rookie target for Gilliam's slingshots is number 88, Lynn Swan. With the Colts reeling from the long distance bombing, Gilliam displayed a new talent, the poise to set up and feather touch a screen pass. Then number 35, Steve Davis, piled up more passing yardage with his legs. Gilliam had passed his first test. In all, the hot shot from Tennessee State completed 17 of 31 for 257 yards and two touchdowns. The first on a fly pattern to Lynn Swan. The second on a sprint out to number 43, Frank Lewis. While Gilliam staked his claim to a permanent position, the steel curtain was making things miserable for the struggling Colts. Number 47, Mel Blunt snuffed out Baltimore's last hope to avoid a shutout and gave the Steeler offense a chance to prove it had more than Joe Gilliam's right arm to depend on. Number 32, Franco Harris made the running game look healthy as well, and the Pittsburgh Steelers rolled to an impressive 30 to nothing victory. Back where three-year pro Joe Gillum would start, and at middle linebacker, where a rookie, Jack Lambert, number 58, treaded water for a while, got his feet wet, and then came on with a splash. With Lambert in the middle, the Steeler defense rose up in a mighty goal line stand that keyed their shutout of the Colts. Rock rib defense was nothing new for Pittsburgh fans, but Jefferson Street Joe Gillum was, and he was magnificent, leading the Steeler offense to 30 points. Two first-year wide receivers, John Stallworth, number 82, and Lynn Swan, number 88, also had splendid debuts. In all, 14 rookies made the Steeler roster, and mixed with young veterans like Frank Lewis, number 43, the Steelers were young, but they were tough. It took only one play for Denver to capitalize. Otis Armstrong took Charlie Johnson's pass and went 45 untouched yards to score. 
screen to Steve Davis on the line of scrimmage, and the stocky setback made a great effort and took advantage of fine downfield blocking to go 61 yards to the tying touchdown. A look from our isolated camera demonstrates Gilliam's fast feet and super quick release as the linemen were sucked in to set up the screen. The game was now tied at seven. On the very next series, Charlie Johnson came up with his second long pass of the day and Haven Moses made it work. A repeat shows that Flying Moses had badly beaten his defender and would have scored if he hadn't had to leave his feet. The Broncos were now on top 14 to 7. Joe Gilliam, determined to bring his team right back, went to the air lanes and hit Frank Lewis, who in turn was hit by Calvin Jones. Number 51, Mike Simone, was the recipient of Lewis's gift and lumbered all the way to the one. From the one, John Keyworth went in for the touchdown that brought the score to a surprising 21-7 advantage for the Denver Broncos. With room to run, the rookie from Georgia rambled all the way to the Denver 29. That would be the last shot for the Steelers in the first period, for Kahn's long run was wiped out by a clipping penalty, and the inability of Pittsburgh's receivers to hold on to passes hampered Gilliam's effort to get his team back on the scoreboard. The virtuosity of the Steeler receivers have been much publicized already this season, but in this first quarter they dropped pass after pass and generally were intimidated by the Broncos secondary. Late in the second quarter, however, Gilliam turned to his ground troops and Pittsburgh began to move the ball. First, Franco Harris bruised the Broncos, then Steve Davis, who has replaced Frenchy Fuqua and gives Pittsburgh two big backs. When Gilliam returned to the air, 5'7", Cal Jones manhandled 6'2", John Stallworth on the left sideline. So Jefferson Joe went to the other side and hit Frank Lewis at the sideline for a short game. Once again, Pittsburgh's running backs did more with the pass than the wide receivers could, as Franco Harris took a swing pass to the one. Harris claimed he was in, but a look from the end zone shows he lost possession of the ball before he reached pay dirt. At the end of a pass-filled first half, the Steeders had come on strong, but the Broncos still led 21-14. At the start of the second half, the Steeders maintained their late first half momentum, forcing a turnover on Denver's third play from scrimmage. 
Mike Wagner intercepted Johnson's lame duck, and a repeat reveals why. Johnson was hit hard by Joe Green just as he threw, forcing the flutter ball. With excellent field position, Gilliam moved the Steelers in to tie. Franco Harris was the main man on the drive, making a fine catch for 14 yards, then crunching for 10 more down to the Denver one-yard line. From the one, Steve Davis banged it home, and the two teams were tied. Pittsburgh 21, Denver 21. But Denver's 21 points did not figure to get any higher. The steel curtain rarely allows that many points, let alone any more. And with Johnson lost, the Bronco offense was hurting. Number 63, John Grant, and Lyle Alzado recovered on the Pittsburgh 41. The break was all the Broncos needed to bust free. Otis Armstrong got six on the left side, then blazed through right tackle for 32 yards to the Steeler three. From there, Ramsey sent Billy Van Heusen in motion to the right, flooding that zone, and hit wide open Riley Odoms for the touch. Though Johnson was gone, a combination of Steeler mistakes and good relief pitching put Denver back on top, 28-21. Strong, but his crackling arm was, nailing Stallworth in the seams of the zone. Stallworth and Lynn Swan are two rookie wide receivers who made the Steeler roster this year. In fact, the Steelers are so deep at the catching positions that Ron Shanklin, the Steelers' leading receiver last year, is yet to catch a pass this season. And now the Steeler receivers, who had betrayed Gilliam in the first half, were catching everything he threw. First, Stallworth made a super catch, outfighting two Broncos. Stallworth was ruled out of bounds, but no matter, Gilliam came right back and got a diving catch out of another rookie, Randy Grossman from Temple University. The catch was legal, but officials ruled that Grossman's run was not kosher. From the 10, Gilliam got still another great catch from Frank Lewis. Lewis's feet were in the end zone, but the ball came down on the one. And from there, Davis scored his second touchdown of the quarter. Game tied 28 all, but the tie would not last long. On the second play of the fourth quarter, Ramsey was blitzed by Andy Russell, and the ball squirted right to Marv Kellum on the Denver 16. Four plays after Kellum's catch, John Fuqua squirmed in, and Pittsburgh led for the first time in the game, 35-28. When Calvin Jones popped a Gilliam pass right to Bronco linebacker Tom Jackson, and the Broncos had a big break. Turnover proved costly to the Steelers when Ramsey hung in despite a hard rush and hit Onus Armstrong. Armstrong's touchdown, his second of the day, tied the score for the fourth time in the game. It was now 35-35, but Pittsburgh would mount two more drives in the game's last seven minutes. On the first drive, Gilliam hit on four straight passes, and his receivers held on despite being jolted after every catch. the Denver 41, Gilliam lost the snap. Pittsburgh retained possession, but lost their scoring opportunity. Now out of field goal range. Game 22.
Gilliam eventually drove the Steelers to the Denver 8 with five seconds left, and another chance to end the game in regulation time rode on Roy Jarella's toe. Incredibly, Jarella's almost certain 25-yarder was blocked, and the NFL had its first regular season sudden death game with a score 35 all after four quarters. Times to reach the Steeler 40. From the 40, Gilliam wanted to open up, but in this his third season, he has added poise to his God-given ability, and rather than risk the interception, he ran for 10 and a first down at midfield. Then, facing a big third down and three, Gilliam got plenty of time, used it wisely, and nailed Stallworth for the first down. But after an incompletion, Denver linebacker Tom Jackson made a game-saving play. Jackson blitzed Gilliam back to the Steeler 49 and into a throwing down, and on the next play, Gilliam thought he had number 86, Reggie Garrett open, but ex-Steeler John Rouser intercepted ending Pittsburgh's only threat of the sudden death. But Ramsey went to the well once too often, and on his last carry, Armstrong lost five yards, fourth down on the Pittsburgh 24. Into the game came Jim Turner to try a 41-yard field goal to end the game, a kick that Bronco head coach John Ralston said after the game, Turner would make 39 out of 40 times. This one must have been try number 40. Turner missed, and now just three minutes remained. Neither team could gain even one more first down. And In Denver, Gillum's buggy whip right arm accounted for 31 completions and 348 yards, including a spectacular screen to Steve Davis as the high-powered Steeler offense rolled to 35 more points. But Pittsburgh also gave up 35 points, and the Steelers settled for an unsatisfying tie. Then, after scoring 65 points in their first two games, the Steeler offense disappeared. The Oakland Raider defense was the magician, and the Steelers lost 17 to nothing. Pittsburgh's progress was a patchwork. One devastating win, one disappointing tie, and one depressing defeat. Last week, the Pittsburgh Steelers found themselves in Houston with their backs to the dome. The Oilers were ready to steal victory as this interception by number 42, Tommy Maxwell, attests. Historically, the Oilers are supposed to be a breather on everyone's schedule, but this year they've been a tough bunch of headhunters who leave people breathless. Last week, the Houston defense blunted the Pittsburgh attack and pounced on Steeler miscues, like this Steve Davis fumble recovered and returned by number 63, Ronnie Carroll. It seemed evident that Ronnie was pleased by his superb effort. The Oilers jumped to a 7-0 lead on a 47-yard end around by William White Shoes Johnson. But alas, it was all the scoring Houston would muster despite the fact that Johnson tried to appease the touchdown gods with a quaint tribal dance indigenous to teams of the far southwest. In the second half, number 26 Preston Pearson entered the game for the Steelers and stole the show. He rushed for 117 yards in two periods, as well as presenting a deep threat as a receiver. In 
the last quarter, with the Steelers trailing 7-6, Pearson skirted right in to put Pittsburgh ahead for the first time, 13-7. The Oilers mounted one final scare when Maxwell again intercepted. However, the theft accounted for naught, but to make Pittsburgh grateful that their breather in Houston was finally over. Such inconsistency would gnaw at the superstructure of the Steelers and threaten to ruin their season. Against the Houston Oilers, the Steelers scored just 13 points and actually trailed 7-6 in the fourth quarter. The Oilers enjoyed their touchdown immensely, but it was the only one they got as the Pittsburgh defense paved the road to a 13-7 Steeler victory. It wasn't expected to be much of a tussle for the Steel Gang defenders as Pittsburgh invaded Arrowhead Stadium last Sunday to battle the Chiefs. And aside from some sporadic passing by number 10, Mike Livingston, the struggle that wasn't expected never showed. Livingston fired completions to a variety of receivers like old pro Otis Taylor, number 89 and newcomer Barry Pearson, number 85. Livingston totaled almost 250 yards passing while throwing a third touchdown pass, this time to Elmo Wright. But the big story of the game was Livingston's ability to spot wide open Pittsburgh defenders and then hit them dead in the hand. In fact, Livingston fired five interceptions into the eager arms of the Steelers, the most spectacular of which came when Glenn Edwards stole one for a 49-yard touchdown. The Chiefs then let their old pro Lenny Dawson take his turn at throwing an interception, after which followed the passing debut of the Kansas City hope of the future, rookie David James, number 12. Number 59, Jack Ham welcomed the rookie into the NFL with an interception that was the Steelers' seventh of the game. Meanwhile, the Pittsburgh offense moved under the guidance of number 17, Joe Gilliam. Gilliam's passing helped set up short scores by Rocky Blyer and number 26, Preston Pearson. His only scoring pass came on a deep post pattern to a wide open Frank Lewis, number 43. When it was all over, Pittsburgh finally claimed a 34-24 win. Facing the Chiefs the next week, the defense claimed nine turnovers and put points on the board on Glenn Edwards' 50-yard interception return as defense keyed another Steeler victory. Though Chuck Knoll was concerned over his sleeping giant offense, one thing that never let him down was the magnificent Steel Curtain defense. It wasn't expected to be much of a tussle for the Steel Gang defenders as Pittsburgh invaded Arrowhead Stadium last Sunday to battle the Chiefs. And aside from some sporadic passing by number 10, Mike Livingston, the struggle that wasn't expected never showed. Livingston fired completions to a variety of receivers like old pro Otis Taylor, number 89 and newcomer Barry Pearson, number 85.
Livingston totaled almost 250 yards passing while throwing a third touchdown pass, this time to Elmo Wright. But the big story of the game was Livingston's ability to spot wide open Pittsburgh defenders and then hit them dead in the hand. In fact, Livingston fired five interceptions into the eager arms of the Steelers, the most spectacular of which came when Glenn Edwards stole one for a 49-yard touchdown. The Chiefs then let their old pro Lenny Dawson take his turn at throwing an interception, after which followed the passing debut of the Kansas City hope of the future, rookie David James, number 12. Number 59, Jack Ham welcomed the rookie into the NFL with an interception that was the Steelers' seventh of the game. Meanwhile, the Pittsburgh offense moved under the guidance of number 17, Joe Gilliam. Gilliam's passing helped set up short scores by Rocky Blyer and number 26, Preston Pearson. His only scoring pass came on a deep post pattern to a wide open Frank Lewis, number 43. When it was all over, Pittsburgh finally claimed a 34-24 win. At Three Rivers Stadium, Pittsburgh defensive end Dwight White told an official that he thought more holding penalties should be called. Unfortunately for the Cleveland Browns, they needed billy clubs or cattle prods, not hands, to fend off the black and gold rush. The Steelers earned the first break when Hugh McInnes fumbled after a hard hit by Glenn Edwards. Edwards, number 27, trailed the play alertly and recovered teammate Mike Wagner's air ball. While the lightning strike has been absent from the Steeler attack recently, they can still rely on the sporadic brilliance of Franco Harris. Pittsburgh built a 14-0 lead on touchdowns by Harris and running mate Preston Pearson, number 26. But Cleveland hung tough and weathered the storm on the wheels of many scooter Greg Pruitt. Always an adept improviser, quarterback Mike Phipps was forced to wing it in on the run against the rampaging Steelers. A Phipps bomb connection was a rarity, but his scrambling was not, as he ran the Browns back into the game. Cleveland drew to within a missed extra point at 14-13 when Phipps found Milt Morin floating free and easy. Although the Steelers bumbled along on offense, they held a 20 to 16 lead in the fourth quarter. Mike Phipps' last chance to produce victory produced an interception by the omnipresent Glenn Edwards. The interception was just about the death knell for Cleveland title aspirations in the AFC Central as Pittsburgh and Cincinnati are off and front running. In what order you'd name them, the Steeler front four just kept coming. By the end of the regular season, 52 pass pockets had been pillars. The battle lines were drawn. 
the foot soldiers of the offensive line ready when the Steelers faced the Atlanta Falcons. Rocky Blyer proved to be more than just a blocker, and Franco Harris rushed for over 100 yards for the first time in 1974, beginning a streak that would see him gain exactly 800 yards in the season's last eight years. The next week against the Eagles, Bradshaw's confident cool under a heavy rush breathed life back into the passing game as the Steelers rolled up 27 points. The Eagles got no points and were outscored when Mel Blunt returned an interception for a score. With a crushing 27-0 victory and a 6-1-1 record, the Steelers at last appear to have everything together. But the sword of inconsistency still hung over them. No, this isn't Arrowhead Stadium in Kansas City. It's Arrowhead Ernie Holmes, a member of the Steel Curtain Steeler defense. And no, this isn't a popcorn salesman. It's me. I lost my pass, and this was the only way I could figure to get in to see the ball game. One thing that many in offense hasn't been able to figure out is the dominating defense of the Pittsburgh Steelers. The Eagles certainly couldn't. Eagle runners were held to just 66 yards, and Roman Gabriel could amass just 29 yards passing. Statistics are nice, but they don't win football games. Turnovers claim do, and the Steelers use several to put the game away. Lynn Edwards' interception led to a field goal, and Joe Green claimed Tom Bailey's fumble and careened to the Eagle 15. Many have said that the Steelers are all defense, but their offense has been rounding into shape. Franco Harris made good on Green's recovery, and Franco appears ready to recapture his glorious rookie season. But the big change in the Steeler offense has been at quarterback. Chuck Knoll has decided to go with Terry Bradshaw again, replacing pass conscious Joe Gillum, who failed to continue his preseason showing. Bradshaw adds a new element to the Steeler attack, for he can really hoof it. This 34-yard scamper was the longest run of the day, but Bradshaw's running ability means much more. He's able to escape pocket ambushes and still locate a receiver. And when Bradshaw isn't hurried, he can throw as tight a spiral as any quarterback in the game. So the Steeler offense appears to be awakening. And just in case they take a short nap on some Sunday in the future, there's always the Steeler defense to put points on the scoreboard. Mel Blunt's 52-yard interception return completed the Steeler scoring in a 27-0 feather plucking of the Eagles. The Steeler playoff drive is in full gear, while for the Eagles, who had entertained playoff hopes themselves, their fourth loss may have finished them. With a chance to put away their closest pursuers for good, the Steelers failed four times from the 20-yard line late in the game and lost 17-10 to to the Bengals. After two convincing wins, an inconsistent performance by the Pittsburgh offense again cast a shadow of doubt on the Steelers' season. 
Last week, Cincinnati's quarterback, Ken Anderson, was bigger than life in a record-shattering performance against the Pittsburgh Steelers. For the day, he connected on 20 of 22 passes to set a new single-game completion percentage mark of 91%. In addition to that, he set a new consecutive completion mark of 16 in a row, a string which began two weeks ago and continued over the steel curtain. Anderson's passing put the Bengals in good shape early, and number 43, Ed Williams, put them on the board 7 to nothing, despite protestations by Pittsburgh's number 27, Glenn Edwards, from whom you'll hear more of later. In addition to Anderson's passing, the Bengals also benefited from a scintillating punt return by number 37, Tommy Casanova. This led to a field goal and a 10-0 lead. You are about to witness magnificence. When the Cincinnati margin got almost comfortable, the Bengals began to miscue. A spectacular reception by number 18 Charlie Joyner was null and void, when Joyner subsequently fumbled and Pittsburgh recovered. And then Ken Anderson ran into some real trouble when in scrambling for the sidelines, he was strung out by Glenn Edwards. So Anderson left the game briefly due to a ringing cranium, while Edwards exited for good due to an unsportsmanlike display of overzealousness. All that aside, the Steelers got on the board on Preston Pearson's short jaunt, following a Bengal one-yard score which made it 17-10 Cincinnati. And then once again, the game centered on controversy. Number 26, Charlie Davis, was aiming the Bengals for another score when the ball got loose. But did it get loose after he was down or not? No one seemed to know and no whistles blew. So Pittsburgh's number 23, Mike Wagner, helped himself and soloed 69 yards before the Bengals could collect their wits. The play and the day were both saved by Ken Anderson, who turned himself into the NFL's groggiest record setter. Then, with time running down, it was all up to the Cincinnati defense. And as they had all afternoon, when it counted, the Bengal protectors repeatedly repulsed quarterback Terry Bradshaw's last-ditch efforts. 17-10 Cincinnati victory tightened the AFC Central race considerably, and now the Bengals trail the Steelers by only half a game in a division where even a steel curtain can't afford to sag. And led to another change. Against Cleveland, Terry Hanratty stepped into the breach and started strongly with a strike to Ron Shanklin. Hanratty would complete just two passes in the game, and the 74 Steelers' success formula was called on again. Running, not passing, and hard rock defense led to the Steelers' first victory in Cleveland since 1964. It's always bitter and often bizarre. It's called the Turnpike Rivalry, and the Browns and Steelers have been at it now for 25 years. Gone are the Otto Grahams and Bobby Lanes, however, and last Sunday in their place were such unlikely heroes as Cleveland rookie quarterback Brian Seip 
and Pittsburgh's third string passer Terry Hanratty, who was starting in hopes of energizing Pittsburgh's passing game. But Pittsburgh's ineffective passing continued as Hanratty was intercepted thrice and was victimized time and time again by hole in the hand receivers. The Steelers' air attack was so dreadful that they completed only three passes in 19 tries. But some of the credit has to go to Cleveland's secondary, which was tough near their own goal line. Luckily for Pittsburgh, they do have a reborn running game, and Steve Davis and Franco Harris ran often and ran well. Franco romped for 156 yards on 23 carries, the 11th time he's gone over the century mark in his brief career. Pittsburgh's running set up four Roy Girella field goals, and their first touchdown came when Hanratty managed to hit on two big passes to Ron Shanklin. They were the only completions he made all day. For Cleveland, young Brian Seip has replaced Mike Phipps and has brought back the short passing game reminiscent of the Bill Nelson day. But Seip has the arm to go long too and this pass to Milton Morin gave Cleveland's offense its best shot of the day. Unfortunately, Seip also has a penchant for giving up the ball. He was intercepted three times. Altogether, there were 13 turnovers in this wild ball game. Things got so bad that even mean Joe Green, number 75, intercepted his first pass ever. It was the Browns' secondary, and Van Green in particular, that finally got Cleveland a touchdown. The score, combined with three field goals, gave Cleveland the lead until early in the fourth quarter. But the 13th turnover in the game made the difference as Joe Green picked up Billy LaFear's fumble and lateral to J.T. Thomas for the final touchdown. Pittsburgh's victory was their first in 10 years in Cleveland and put them a game and a half ahead of the Bengals in the AFC Central Division. Juggernaut was the opinion of most concerning the Pittsburgh Steelers at the outset of this season. But the Steelers have not rolled rejoicing through their schedule. And now reluctant juggernaut seems to be a more apt description. And another piece of the popular wisdom condemning the Houston Oilers as inept had to be revised last week when the Oilers met the Steelers in Three Rivers Stadium. For as one writer artfully described the Pittsburgh Steelers at the end of last season, the Houston Oilers now seem to be but a few bricks short of a load. And none of those bricks seem to be needed on defense as the Oilers' D rendered the Pittsburgh offense practically impotent. In fact, the only sustained offensive drive of the day was concluded by this pass from Dante Pastorini to Fred Willis in the second quarter, making the score Pittsburgh 3, Houston 7. The Steelers did manage one touchdown, and that also came in the second quarter and was the result of this poised effort by Terry Bradshaw, who remained upright and cool long enough to spot Franco Harris in the end zone, making the score Houston 7, Pittsburgh 10 at the half.
But Bradshaw, under enormous pressure all day, gave away as much as he got. And this pass, which bounced off Ron Shanklin's hands and into the midst of middle linebacker Greg Bingham, resulted in a field goal tying the score at 10 midway through the third stanza. Indeed, the Oilers' defense dumped Steeler quarterbacks four times for 57 yards in losses, while allowing only six first downs and 84 yards of net offense. With time rapidly ebbing in this defensive classic, Dante Pastorini summoned his gang to one big push into Pittsburgh territory. With the drive dead at the Steelers' 17, place kicker Skip Butler trusted skill against twisting wintry winds, and he succeeded narrowly, gaining the vital difference in this 13-10 upset victory for Houston. And at the end, in the darkness of a long afternoon, unable to overcome the oppressive Oiler defense, the Steelers slipped from the field mere shadows of the juggernaut that was once proclaimed by the popular wisdom. When the Steelers met the Saints, two more changes were made. Steve Furness, number 64, filled in for the injured Ernie Holmes on defense. On offense, Terry Bradshaw was back as Pittsburgh punished New Orleans 28-7. With another brace of impressive wins, the Steelers again seemed to be gathering momentum. But then the bugaboo of inconsistency flew up and bit them again. Playing in a blizzard, the Steelers managed just 10 points and lost to the Oilers. This was the blackest loss of all, for it kept the Bengals alive as the Steelers traveled to Foxborough for a tough game against the Patriots. Protection and completed a pass to Randy Vataha, New England's lone remaining receiver of any note. It went for 21 yards. His fumble was after the whistle had blown the play dead. Next, Mac Heron began his assault on Gail Sayers' total yardage record with an 11-yard burst through the right side. A repeat shows what makes the little man so valuable as he found his hole, then ducked under the tackles of Andy Russell and Mike Wagner for extra yardage. The season has taken its toll on Heron, who is feeling the effects of being without Cunningham in the backfield. He's the man enemy defenses key on, and Heron has been playing hurt. Of course, he gets maximum exposure to injury because of his play on the special teams that go along with his duties as a starting running back. Heron had taken the ball down to the 17, and Jim Plunkett came right back to him, slanting over the middle for a diving touchdown. For Pittsburgh to win, it would have to move on the ground. And on the next series, Franco Harris burst through the left side for 25 yards. That was as far as Pittsburgh got, however. And as the second quarter began, Roy Girella kicked a 40-yard field goal for Pittsburgh's first score. plays of the game as Mac Heron fumbled the ball to Mel Blount number 47. The Steelers had a huge break at the Patriot 19 and their strategy was simple. Give the ball to Franco. As Franco Harris and his teammates made their way inexorably toward the Patriot goal line, go Harris. That, it was no surprise, mattered not at all. Harris scored anyways. The extra point was missed, but Pittsburgh took the lead for the first time today. On the next series, Pittsburgh again stopped Heron when Andy Russell blitzed him for a loss of five yards. And for the veteran linebacker, it was sweet revenge for being victimized by Heron earlier in the game. This set up a punt by Dave Chappell, but his effort was good for only 16 yards past the line of scrimmage to the 29.
Pittsburgh took advantage of this poor kick and converted it into three points on a Jarella field goal. Pittsburgh increased its lead to five points. The Steelers soon got the ball back again when Jim Plunkett's attempt over the middle was intercepted by Jack Ham. Although the Steelers could do nothing with this gift, because Roy Jarella's field goal attempt from 47 yards out was wide, the momentum of this game had very definitely changed away from New England. Pittsburgh's rock rib defense was now in control of this game. Fitted from a holding call against Pittsburgh, and then from the Patriots 47, Plunkett loosed this lightning which came to earth 48 yards later in care of Mac Heron. Another look at the play establishes that the Steelers were off sides, and in scrambling to get back, the rhythm of their rush was disrupted, affording Plunkett, for one of the few times this afternoon, all the time he needed to produce such a play. But there the steel curtain descended, right on New England's necks, and the Patriots were left squirming three yards shy of satisfaction. After this desperate third down scramble, the New England had to settle for three off the instep of Englishman John Smith, making the halftime total Steelers 12, Patriots 10, and still anybody's ball game. Hang on, and Donnie Shell, one of 14 rookies on the Pittsburgh roster, recovered for the Steelers at the Patriots 41 yard line. Chewing the run now, Bradshaw found Frank Lewis curling open in the New England zone, 25 yards downfield. One play later, Bradshaw hit Lewis right in the hands at the goal line, but Lewis could not make the catch. And deflected off Jack Mildren, the ball bounced to Prentice McRae, whose end zone interception killed this Pittsburgh opportunity. A ground level look at the play shows that Bradshaw did well to deliver the ball as accurately as he did for Sugar Bear Hamilton was all over him as he released it. But Plunkett and company could not earn a first down through nearly 13 minutes of the third quarter. 38. One play later, Bradshaw drilled Frank Lewis for a 17-yard gain, and Pittsburgh was once again challenging deep in Patriots territory. Short, tough runs by Rocky Blyer, number 20, and Franco Harris advanced the ball to the seven. From there, Bradshaw hurled to number 88, Lynn Swan, who made a diving catch in the end zone, increasing the Steelers' lead to 19 to 10 after almost a full period of domination, both offensively and defensively, by the Steelers. While across the way, Joe Willie Gillum warmed up unexpectedly, perhaps signaling a change in Steelers' strategy, but more likely a worsening of pain in Terry Bradshaw's sore ribs. And the fans at Foxborough waited hushed to see if this change of quarterbacks would catch their hard-pressed defense out of adjustment. But Gillum's entrance into the game brought no new wrinkles to the Pittsburgh attack, and the Patriots' defense continued to hang tough. Hold on the game, building its conference-leading total of quarterback sacks to 52. Patriots bench watched with the fascination that only something horrible can command. So menacing was Pittsburgh's defense. Seized the Patriots till they popped as Elsie Greenwood decked Jim Plunkett in his own end zone, increasing the Steelers' lead to 11 points and putting the Patriots two touchdowns away from victory, now midway through the last quarter. John White towed a driving knuckler upfield. Lynn Swan controlled the ball and headed upfield where number 59, Rodrigo Barnes, stripped him of the precious football and Craig Hanneman fell on it, providing the spark the Patriots and their fans had so patiently awaited through this long defense-dominated half. Jim Plunkett delivered hesitantly but nonetheless accurately to Randy Vataha, planting the ball firmly in Pittsburgh's end of the field off a 13-yard gain inside Pittsburgh's 15. Plunkett then caught tight end Bob Adams with a look in to the seven. 
swept right in six plays later and plugged it in for the score. The Steeders' sixth place stand had all but drained the clock, but still, Patriots fans rejoiced, not for victory, but for the never-say-die attitude that has inflamed New England with love for these gallant Patriots. Aaron's touchdown narrowed the score to Pittsburgh 21, New England 17. And when the Patriots' onside's kick failed, that score became final. And it was the Steelers who celebrated victory, as well as hard-won supremacy in the AFC Central Division and a third invitation to the playoffs in the last three seasons, after 39 years of championship drought. But it had been an unexpectedly difficult pull for the Steelers, who many experts described as a juggernaut in the preseason. But pull and pull together they did all the long uphill way, and with their offense, now firmly rooted in basic bully tactics, and with a defense unparalleled in passion and precision, the Steelers' black and gold seems as likely to fly on Super Sunday as the Howard Johnson's colors of the Miami Dolphins, or the silver and black representing the pride and poise boys in Oakland. For Terry Bradshaw, the game was the turning point in his career. Unlike earlier in the season, when Chuck Knoll had replaced him after a loss, Knoll now stuck with Bradshaw. And in a game where the offense simply had to get it done, they did. The Steelers were champions of the AFC Central Division, but their crowning as division titleists was greeted as much with a sigh of relief as with a joyous shout. For the end to an on-again, off-again regular season was behind them, and a new one was just beginning. Poor Wayne Clark had the envious duty of quarterbacking the plunging Bengals against the playoff-bound Steelers. And like the rest of his team, he fared poorly. Although the Steelers did not play a strong game, they thoroughly dominated the Bengals, winning 27-3. Rookie Lynn Swan, number 88, continued his record-breaking returns as he ended up the year with more punt return yardage than anyone else in the NFL and it's easy to see why. With Terry Bradshaw at quarterback, the Steeler offense moved with ease through the moribund Bengal defense. And the easiest mover of them all was receiver John Stallworth, who hauled in six passes for 105 spectacular yards. Pittsburgh's first score came in the first quarter when Bradshaw connected with Stallworth in the end zone. This five-yard pass was soon followed by the old tackle eligible play as Bradshaw found number 72 tackle Jerry Mullins wide open to make it 14 to nothing. The only real drama in the game was provided by Franco Harris as he neared the magic 1,000-yard rushing mark. Harris found the moment that all runners dream about when late in the third quarter with a first and 10 at the Steeler 26, 
He bolted around right in for 14 yards and surpassed 1,000 yards for the season. With the playoffs in sight and a 27-3 victory, the Steelers' final regular season game, although far from perfect, was enough to ensure a 10-3-1 record, the third best in the league, and a good night's sleep. It was the day of the playoffs in Pittsburgh, PA, a time for the Bills to get down and pray. The steel curtain was hung by the fans with great care in hopes that Greenwood, Holmes Green and White might cause the Bills to wish they weren't there. But the Bills were there and surprisingly enough on this day it was the Pittsburgh attack that shone as Mel Blunt returned the opening kickoff 42 yards that put the Steelers in good position right away. Terry Bradshaw exuded newfound poise and calm to go along with his great strength, and the Steelers capped their first possession with a Roy Girello field goal. Mixing his plays well and taking much upon himself, Bradshaw could not be stopped except by his own teammates, in this case, number 50, Jim Clack. Despite such miscues, Bradshaw remained imperturbable, and early in the second quarter, with a day and a half to throw, he struck 27 yards through the air to number 20, Rocky Blyer. The Steelers were never headed. Thanks again to a repeat, we see Bradshaw first faking a handoff to Blyer, who then circles downfield to arrive in a wide-open rendezvous with the ball. The next time Pittsburgh had the ball, Bradshaw sent number 88 Lynn Swan winging around in for a 25-yard pickup. Later in the drive, Swan almost took it in on this flat pass, which he high-stepped to the one-yard line. Franco Harris finished the job by bullying in to put the Steelers on top 16 to 7. While the Golden Black offense was whooping it up, the defense in the person of number 59 Jack Ham was swooping down on the juice, and OJ was squeezed repeatedly. But when OJ was stopped, number 34 Jim Braxton stepped in and ripped off a beautiful 30-yard gain. However, the run's effect was somewhat ruined by a fumble at the end, which Pittsburgh recovered. For the Bills, it was a time for eyes to glint pain and worry because another Steelers score at this juncture could mean curtains. And curtains it was to be as Bradshaw could perform no wrong. When his passes were off, his receivers made great catches as Rocky Blyer did here. Like a dreadnought, the steel machine continued to roll and fly. Bradshaw was pinpoint perfect, and Lynn Swan's diving catch left the Steelers with only four yards to grind. Franco Harris polished those four yards off in a hurry to make the score 22 to seven. The Buffalo team's disgust was evident in their helpless complaining, and they obviously needed regrouping. 14 for 166 yards. And this one was the shot that brought the Buffalo down. A beautiful pass and a leaping catch by number 87, Larry Brown, put the Bills at the cliff's edge of defeat. The same play from another angle points up the Steelers' perfect timing and the helplessness to stop it that the Bills must have been feeling. For the third time in the first half, Franco Harris powered in to make the score 29 to seven. 
along with good old Santa Champ, the rest of the uproarious Steeler crowd, realized that the second half would be a mere formality. But Bradshaw and his assassins were still not satisfied. And again, Terry drove them downfield where Roy Girella popped another field goal. When in the final seconds, Joe Gillum replaced Terry, he too almost brought the Steelers in for a score. This run by Steve Davis, number 35, fell just inches short, despite appearances. But the Pittsburgh Steelers showed up short nowhere at all last Sunday, as they ousted the Bills in the playoffs 32 to 14. For the Bills, it was a disappointing ending to a good season, and they should remember that only one team will end its season without disappointment. Besides that, at least they've avoided the disagreeable job of having to cope with the Oakland Raiders in the boisterous Oakland Coliseum. But on the basis of last Sunday, one would say the Steelers look ready for anything. on his 38, 40, 45, 50. Spins in Oakland territory and he's met head on there on the Oakland 48 yard line. The man at 46. Bradshaw's trying to audible. You can see him trying to get that sound. I don't believe they all got it either. Gonna run it. This is where he can hurt you. First down. He averaged 10 yards a carry against Buffalo last week. He not only uh, is nimble, but he is so strong. Got a little stay in. Unless there's a mistake and they're allowed one mistake a game. Harris outside, running for a first down. Franco Harris. That was again Tony Klein back in at the defensive end. Bubba just came out that time. Again and ahead, 3-0. 340 to go in the first period. Bradshaw's attempted two passes. No completion. Rocky Blyer. And they're picking up some ground outside, right and left on the Raiders. Flyers hit there by uh, Gerald Irons and Dan Connors, the two linebackers, also Horace Jones. Third down and four for the Steelers. Bradshaw with the field spread out in front of him. Flares at the Flyer, 15. Flyer first down as he drives to the nine-yard line. He dumped it off to his safety belt man very cleverly, and now the Steelers have quite a drive going for themselves. Boy, they sure have, and the big thing, he gets away. Uh-oh. He'll take off. Yeah. And he stopped. He can move, can he, for he... a big man? The crowd's not helping him. It's up, and the kick is... He missed it. No good. Oh, no. No good. <laughs> That's awful. They were sticking right up there for him. And he nation has averaged 48 yards a kick with two punts. Swan and Edwards are deep. Guy gets a towering spiral away. Taken by Swan and he's 32. The USC rookies at the 35. And he's driven out of bounds. Flag is down. Flag is down downfield. It was Warren Banks in 46 to make the tackle. Maybe the second hit out of bounds. See what they're going to do. There's an ineligible man downfield on the punt, and also a personal foul. The place of Stalwart. Swans to the right, third down, four. Bradshaw shoots it, completes it. That's right on target. Perfect pass to the tight end, Larry Brown, number 87. Couldn't have been a better pass. Yeah, they haven't touched him. Franco Harris on a sweep. 25, and he's upended there by Jack Tatum, probably the hardest hitting deep secondary man throw football back. Woody Hayes holds down a pass. And that kick is up, and it is good. We've got a tie game. They tie the game with 9.34 to go in the first. He's out to the 20, 25, 30, finds a hole, and spins his way upfield to the 40-yard line. Good hard running. Now they're going to spot him back on the 39. Steelers on their 39, first down. Kick right with a run, and Franco Harris first through and gets six yards to his 45. Today. First through the regular season. Second down, four. Flyer. Flyer has a first down and more. 
He's in open territory. Keeps going. I'm trying to fire. Flyer again. And he may have the first down as he sprints to the 21 yard line. 21. Batch of time wide open at the 8 yard line. It's number 82, the rookie John Stallworth. He's hit by Atkinson. It'll be first down and goal to go for Pittsburgh. Look at that, and look at that. A touchdown. Frank O'Hara scores up the middle. And the Steelers are right back in with that powerful ground game of theirs today. Boy, and is it in the tent. Looks like one of those games. Oh, yeah. Remember, the tie will go into extra periods. Raiders on their own 30. They blow right at him. Look out, there it is. Oh, it's yeah. intercepted by Ham. Ham's at the 10 and down to the 9. That hound is falling out. Can he move? And he, he can move. They had well. a big rush on him, and Stabler had to unload it. First and goal to go. Bradshaw will put it up. Too high. And this one oh, is flag, a flag in the end zone. Flag dropped in the end zone. It's going to be holding against Oakland, I believe. The line of the Steelers has been blown off the ball. They might look for the big train, number 32, to come in. There's Tom's. First and four to go for a Pittsburgh touchdown. The Steelers were trailing 10 to three. Best football when they had to. Bradshaw throws a slant right for a touchdown. Got him, right there. There it is, the Lynn Swan on a slant, and the rookie, who has been phenomenal the last three games, puts the Steelers out in front. And Bradshaw to Lynn Swan. Good protection. He looked at Swan all the way. That's where he was going through it, right by Connors. Off at eight against Miami. Good protection. Now he gets away and he's hit. That's, there's a flag down in the secondary on J.T. Thomas. A flag oh, on that J.T. Was... Thomas. Pass pattern, 17-13 Pittsburgh. Here's a deep pass. Intercepted. It's going to be intercepted by Thomas. That They're could be the game. Right. Thomas is back to the 40. The trying to stay over. in bounds as he cuts to the middle of the field. And he's down to the 24. Steelers oh, put that boy. one up for grabs. That's what you call. One minute to go, and the Steelers should have it now. Super Bowl. Defensive line told the story today the way they block. Look at That's this. Rocky Blyer. Blyer, an unsung hero coming into the late stretch. Going now emerged as a Pittsburgh star. Timeout by Oakland. They have two more timeouts. Joe Costanza has been our statistician on this championship game. And I'd like to think my spotter, Walter Connie. There goes Frank O'Hare. He's going to score. He scores. Yeah. It is all over. And that Pittsburgh goes over in the 100. Super Bowl. The Steelers and the Vikings will play in the Super Bowl game. NBC will carry the game. Frank O'Hare is the second touchdown. And I believe he's over 100 yards. Let's take a look at this. Franco Harris has been sensational in the stretch. Despite the fact that he missed three games, over a thousand yards, what a run. Let's see Franco by himself. Yeah, Donald. Franco is just doing his thing right up the middle. You have to say that there's probably a little let down in the Oakland sec uh, defensive unit at this time. because The Steelers have defeated the Oakland Raiders 24-13 and go to the Super Bowl to meet the Minnesota Vikings. Right! Can I get something? Get something down there! Get when we get down to Oakland, we gonna be the best, right on Swan? We gonna be back at home on the coast! We gonna kill them, baby! Baby, we to the Super Bowl! Control of the AFC Championship game against the arch enemy Oakland Raiders centered on a supposedly neutral strip of turf. But it was not neutral on this deck. On offense, Ray Mansfield, Sam Davis, Jim Clack, Gordon Gravel, Jerry Mullins, John Cole, and Larry Brown simply owned it. 47 times Franco Harris and Rocky Blyer barged through giant cracks in the Raider defense for over 200 yards.
Frank O'Harris cracked the end zone twice more. And with Terry Bradshaw throwing short and long, plain and fancy, and always straight, the Steelers moved in for the kill. Steel Curtain was no less brilliant in their domination of the scrimmage line, limiting Raider runners to just 29 yards and rattling Snake Stabler into three interceptions. With an awesome display of offensive and defensive football, the Steelers earned their first ever conference championship. And the prophets from Pittsburgh who had predicted Super Bowl Steelers had proved prophetic indeed. Pittsburgh's going to the Super Bowl! We got a feeling! Pittsburgh's going to the Super Bowl! We got a feeling! Pittsburgh's going to the Super Bowl! has a first down. He's brought to the turf by Jeff Wright. All right. We're talking uh, against Oakland. Rocky Blair was a guy that gained right close to 100 yards. You'll see this little trap play come right back up through the middle. A beautiful hole. Nobody's in there. Winston's gone. Seaman's gone. Krause is the first one that picks him up. If you could get a good performance out of Rocky Blair today, everybody looking for Franco Harris, but nobody's going to get Outside is Foreman, and he's hit by Jack Ham, the young, excellent outside linebacker. He's going to be one of the greats before he's through from Johnstown, Pennsylvania. They're going against the wind in this period. Targeting, quick hit, and it's good to the 17-yard line to Dave Osborne coming out of the backfield. And there's the rookie, Jack Lambert, the only rookie starter for the Steelers, the middle linebacker, out of foreign passing. Back he goes again. This is blocked. And it's hit there by L.C. Greenwood. Look at the golden shoes. Edwards are waiting for the ball in Viking territory. The low kick. Edwards fields it on the 44. Trying to get a return right going. 45. Oh! He saw a man coming. And that is Matt Blair. And he said... Matt, I don't want you, and he tried to skid to a halt and held up. Yeah, that was the other one. That uh, pass is complete for a first down to Larry Brown, the tight end of Kansas. Their own 37, Minnesota's 44, and now the Steelers 47. In that excellent position during the entire first period. Flyer playing with shrapnel in his body. Had the bronze star and purple heart from Vietnam. Second down, five, no score. Three minutes to go in the first quarter. Shanklin on a flanker reverse at the 50. You notice the players are slipping today. The late tuners, and it's been raining all morning. Flag is down, double flag down. Nate Wright refused to let that play get outside of him. Well, when you see that kind of a play early, it does tell you something. It tell Delay and then storming through as Harris at the 35. Harris bangs his way inside the 30 to the Minnesota 28. Jim Marshall had to catch it from behind. First period. Bradshaw, the bootleg of the 25 20, and he skipped out of bounds. A very dangerous runner. He's a third running back in the backfield. I was checking some of these uh, pregame statistics, and his average. Gain for carries like 5.7, but there's no way that was an option. He was going to run with it from the beginning. Had a good flow. You see him trying to get a direct a little traffic there. Skips over right coming up. Lost his balance a little, but he's going to go out of bounds. This Second down 10 for the Vikings. Oh, look at that Ernie Holmes. Look at that charge at Holmes on Dave Osborne. 
He almost tackled the ball, the quarterback, and the runner at the same time. We're seeing just beautiful defense. Andy Bauer has moves to the inside. Trying to cut him off, he wrote. He didn't make that cutoff block. Right, Ernie Holmes. Quick trap did not work. Old Arrowhead. That's yeah. old Arrowhead. He's got his he got an arrow right on top of his head. That's a funny game. They've had 61 yards rushing so far. Bradshaw gives the ball to Franco Harris and he rumbles around. He's up to the 20. See how he can get outside. When he gathers that momentum, he can accelerate. He's taken out by Jeff Seaman, the middle linebacker. An opportunist. Play it this way. They wait for mistakes. They've got to run, though, Kurt. They're not doing that. Look at that defensive line and the defensive unit of Pittsburgh. Man, they're all over him. Third and eight for the Vikings. This pass is too high for Chuck Foreman. Down around the five-yard line. Mike Wagner, the strong safety, was there with him. Patrick kick is up, and that kick is no good to the right. Pittsburgh has blown two scoring opportunities. Minnesota has blown one. Third down eight for Pittsburgh from their 24. Bradshaw quick with it. the stalwart. Stalwart. The speedster is brought down. First That's down it. and he's 46. Listen, he can shake it. You bet he can. Today the usual. He has. That's Flyer. Flyer has a hole. And he's into Minnesota territory at the Minnesota 48 where Jeff Seaman Seaman hung it on him. Players in the National Football League kicking against the wind. Shell and Garrett are the outside men going down to the field. Hanging this one up, end over end. It is bounding around, taken on the six yard oh, line. Wow. Not a good move. Sam there. McCullum, a rookie, tried to grab that when they called a fair catch up around the 15. Down seven. I just have the win. Oh, ball, they got here. Safety time. A safety. A safety, and Pittsburgh has scored. Osborne and Tarkinen were going for it. Got away from Tarkinen. Greenwood was putting the heat on, and it's a safety. All right. Only thing I, we, we've been feeling this. It looks like the things are physically. That's Mike White coming in after friends. The mix up, obviously, in the handoff. But, you know, he saved himself five points by jumping on it because he got in a touchdown the other way. So now we'll have the free kick from the 20, and our first score is a safety, fittingly, in a defensive struggle. Boy, it sure is fitting, and it was an odd kind of a call, really, tossing that ball the way Francis did. You know, did. I got a feeling it's supposed to be a fake, and the thing just slipped out of his hand. We'll never know. All right, before they line up for the free kick, again, it's Pittsburgh 2 and Minnesota nothing. Rolling right, rolling right, rolling right. And as he continues that rolling right, rolling right, remember... He loves the surprise, and every once in a while, he explodes John Gilliam. Vikings have all their timeouts left. They're on the 25-yard line of Pittsburgh for the first down. Now he fades straight out of the pocket. Got him. He's got him. Oh, back row, Mel Blunt. Oh, got him. It's intercepted by Mel Blunt. The ball popped high in the air in the end zone. Oh. And the Steelers intercept. Oh. Hey, that's got to be super. If you talk about some coverage, he did have Gilliam open. Take his club into the locker room and try and do something in that Pittsburgh open. This is Frank O'Hara. Harris is up to the 15 to the 20, 25, and he goes out of bounds. He's carried out of bounds by Krause and Wallace, but it's a first down for the Steelers, and also they stop the clock. Frank Call a timeout. They have their full complement left. Bradshaw scrambling out of the pocket. 35 to the 40. Breaks it at the 45. Still going. Slammed at the 50 and is stopped at the 50-yard line. What's going Ooh. on now? Still going, but they blew him dead back at the 50. Get behind. I'm close. Do nothing. He's a good yeah. kick. And it is fumbled by McCollum and just saved. Let's see who's got it. Oh, oh, oh. Right down there at the bottom of the pile is Marv Pelham, the Lone Ranger. Franco Harris. Oh, Get the block. He may go. No, he pushed out. Carl Eller saved it. Eller pushed him out. Second down nine. Look at that opening over there. Running to the flag. Oh, no. Good first ball. Jerry, Jerry Mullins threw the block for him. Boy, did he throw a block, Harry. You call it right on the button. 
Pittsburgh nine and Minnesota nothing. Well, packing to the Pittsburgh 47. That was blocked oh, again. It's intercepted by Joe Green. It was blocked by That's Dwight White. A flag is down and intercepted by Joe Green. Joe Green's second interception of the year. The first and goal to go on the Pittsburgh five after the interference call. Hey, come, and there's uh, a fumble to pile up with a five. Up for the ball is Joe Green. You think me and Joe's run that ball down right there? That's a third turnover against Minnesota, two against Pittsburgh. There goes Franco. Oh, he's piling it up now. That's what he's the Vikings have not been able to do, Kurt. They've not because of the breeze. 20 mile an hour wind that Walden is putting into. But out! He got it. Oh, and yeah, it's a Pittsburgh pitch. Oh, and back Oh, ho! Oh, oh. Gary Brown recovered it. Nice ball, d -roll. Well, you talk about effort, I'll tell you. You've got to give him such great credit. I believe Matt Blair blocked it. Matt Blair, 59, let's look. Oh, Matt, yeah. Matt Blair blocked the punt and it's recovered in the end zone by Terry Brown. Blair was the same guy that made that good hit on the punt return a while ago. He comes in number 59, really broke clean. There are three or four of them around there. That's what you call show business, folks. Just turned around a brand new ball. Byron Harris has gone all the way as running back. Running back is a big game over the 40. And after the 42 is Franco Harris. Good. Gonna throw for it. Gets it deep. And it's tough. Brown, the tight end, has a first down. Fumble the ball. And let's see. Vikings got it. Minnesota has it. It's still wild and woolly, and I love them that way. You love it wild and woolly, and we're seeing it now. All right. A good throw. I think it may have been a little bit behind him. Let's see. He had to come back a little bit, but it's still over. Is that Kraus? No, that's right there. He comes back in, cutting back across. That's why That guy's played a good ball game. And Winston, they knock it loose. They call the ball down right there, so it's still the Steelers' ball. Pittsburgh's ball down the Minnesota 28. This is hitting, hitting the way football was meant to be played. Jackie Wallace there. They're really popping, Don. Both yeah. teams. Now you see that ball coming out pretty quick. That's referee's choice. That's one of those decision things. And his decision was to give it to Pittsburgh. I keep fans going. Flags are down on a straight-ahead play. Rocky Blyer. Flags were dropped on the play. Ball cross. Blyer. Oh, big hole. Running. Loose for a first down. All right. Ball cross on the dropping there. They ripped it open for him that time. All the way to the Steelers. Whatever you think about that. Uh, All right, here it is. Take it, Donald. Uh, D-Roy, it's just that you hit them where they ain't. That's the thing they've been keying on is, is Harris all day. And Blyer had a good game against Oakland last week. Huge hole in there. Cobb's coming out in front of him. Kraus, when you know the safety's making tackles, you know he had some trouble. They have a third down. Five. And a throw. He shoots it. He completes it. He hit Rocky Blyer, just short of the five. Cross tackles in. This drive is used a lot of time. There's a rollout. That's all. Fires. A touchdown. Brown. Harry Brown, the tight end. Thank God of Brown. A 66 yard drive by the Steeler, who surged right back. Falls down, which could be a handicap to him. You'll see Seaman running over. Bradshaw stops and drills this thing right in the middle of Brown. He found his opening back in the middle there. Krause is too late. Bradshaw's been booed for five years in Pittsburgh. He has come into his own the last month. Pittsburgh 16, Minnesota 6. It's a guess. Lacking's ball under 39. Targeting going deep to Gilliam. Intercepted by Mike Wagner. Wagner's at the 40. At the 50, still going. And is down on the Minnesota... 41-yard line. Ron Yerry made the tackle. 229 yards rushing. Michael Harris. 
and he's broken Larry Stalker's Super Bowl record. A new Super Bowl rushing record for Franco Harris. Who's the most valuable player in the game? Is it Harris? Is it Joe Green? Is it Terry Bradshaw? They all are. Or Kirby Greenwood. Yeah, 22 footballs. You have- Up goes Harris. Joe Green. Pittsburgh. The Super Bowl champ. Chuck Knowles up there. Pittsburgh wins it. 16 to 6. Again in Super Bowl IX, the Steelers were simply awesome. Despite the fact that Dwight White literally stepped out of the hospital and onto the field, and injuries to Andy Russell and Jack Lambert later in the game, Lauren Taves and Ed Bradley, number 38, stepped in smartly, and the Steel Curtain gave up just 17 yards rushing and 123 yards total offense. Both Super Bowl records. Fittingly, in a half dominated by defense, the only score was a safety. And with a 2-0 lead, the Steelers got a break on the second half kickoff. Super Bowl most valuable player and record-setting runner Franco Harris used two runs to turn the turnover into a 9-0 lead. Though Pittsburgh had dominated, a blocked punt left them with a precarious lead with 10 minutes to go. But the Steelers had waited 42 years for this game, and Terry Bradshaw summoned the Steeler offense to a blood-and-guts victory drive. their third straight total destruction of championship caliber competition and in their 43rd year of existence the Steelers laid waste to the tired tag same old Steelers a new one now applies the Super Steelers victors in Super Bowl 9 champions of the National Football League